You're listening to the winning literary show, Off the Shelf Books Talk Radio, live with host Denise Turney, author of the books Long Walk Up, Portia, Love More Over Me, Spiral, Love Has Many Faces, and Rosetta's Great Hope. Turn up your dial and get ready for a blast of feature author interviews, 411 on book festivals, writing conferences, and so much more. Ready? Let's go. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I got a lot going on right now. Good morning out there in off-the-shelf land. I want to thank you for all of our loyal listeners been with us. I feel like it's been more than 16 years sometimes, like it's been about 20 years, but we've been on the air for 16 years for sure, started actually on a radio station and then moved to uh, – to podcast, but thank you. And if it's your first time tuning to Off the Shelf, I want to tell you that you are listening to the Winning Book Radio Show, Off the Shelf, and welcome to this Saturday. You guys, time is not waiting on anybody this Saturday, July 23rd. I find it shocking that I'm even saying that. We are at the end of July, so still got time to do whatever it is you set out to do for this year. I guess that we, we're going to introduce him in just a few minutes. He has been on the show before and just loved having him on, so happy to have him on off the shelf again. I know you guys are going to uh, have a treat with him. He's just such a wonderful guest to have on any podcast or any radio show. But before we begin, I just want to ask you, do you love mystery? And not only mystery, but you, you value relationships. I think life is all about relationships. You value relationships, you love a romance, but not a not an unbelievable, a therapy type of romance. Something that's real life, it's got grit to it, and it's something you could say, yeah, I could see that happening. But it also has in there this murder mystery. If you like mystery and you really value relationships, and I say relationships because there's a complicated father-son relationship in the story. Of course, it's a a wonderful love relationship. And these five guys meet in college. They're friends for life. But their friendship has something to do with this murder mystery. If that appeals to you, I encourage you to get a copy of Love Pour Over Me, and you can get it in you can get it in print, you can get it in ebook. If you don't see it on the bookstore shelves or library shelves, just go up to the clerk and tell them you want to get a copy of Love Pour Over Me by Denise Turney. It's carried by the largest book distributors in the world. You can get it online anywhere. If, again, those things appeal to you, not every book appeals to everybody, but if it does, relationships, you like a real true grit romance, and a mystery, very suspenseful. I encourage you to get a copy of Love Pour Over Me. And now let us go and meet our guests. And I know some of you guys, and I'll I'll ask him some questions similar when we kick off the show that I asked him last time because some of you might not have heard the first interview that he did because it was a little while ago. But our special off-the-shelf guest this morning is Jeff Rosley, and Jeff makes his home in Indianapolis. His first published work was a poem, which he published in the Hanover College Fine Arts Journal. He's an avid traveler, as you're going to see as we go through the show. And, in fact, he led, I don't know if he still does, but he used to lead Himalayan treks and mountaineering expeditions. He has scuba dived throughout the Caribbean and sea kayaked in Palau, if I said it right, Tonga, and the Greek Isles. He's also an avid social activist. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago. He was a ladder winner in swimming and football. This guy loves the outdoors and just exploring. And he also earned a JD from Indiana University Law School. To date, Jeff Rosley, and it's spelled R A S L E Y, he has authored 10 books and maybe more since, which include a pickleball soap opera, America's Essential Crisis, One Inherited Our Inherited Obligation to Native Native Nations. You have to get lost before you can be found. Interesting title. Polarized Hero's Journey, Island Adventures, Bringing Progress to Paradise and False Prophet. You can check him out online at jeffrosley dot com and that is J E F F R E Y R A S L E Y dot com. Again, J E F F R E Y R A S L E Y dot com and we are absolutely honored to have Jeff join us on off the shelf this morning and I'm going to bring him on live. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Jeff. 
Thank you, Denise. Good to be with you again. Yes, excited to have you. You were just a wonderful guest, and you've done so much. It's just and then your books and all the different things. There's so much that to talk to you about on any show that you're on. But for our listeners who didn't catch you last time, I want to just give them a little backstory on you. So to start today's show, could you tell us where you grew up, Jeff, and what life was like for you growing up? <laughs> Uh, I grew up in Goshen, Indiana, which is uh, the very far northern end of Indiana, just uh, below the Michigan state line. And when I was a kid, uh, the town had a population of about 10,000, but uh, the population has more than tripled since then. So the the town is a lot than it was then, but it was a, a very sort of middle American, uh, Midwestern uh, life. Uh, there wasn't a lot to do, <laughs> so, so I played a lot of sports. Uh, and then when I got my driver's license, I was really into uh, auto mechanics and had kind of a souped-up car and worked at a gas And then uh, when it was time to go to college, I was uh, really conflicted as to as far as whether I really wanted to go on to college or not, and I went a semester, and then I ended up dropping out, and I hitchhiked across the country, and that big travel adventure, which just uh, turned me on to adventure travel, and that's what I've done for many decades since then. Oh, okay. You again traveling, travel, and coming from Indiana. I was stationed in Indiana when I was in the Navy, and um, it's kind of interesting. Indiana is not like the most. You wouldn't think a person an adventurer. To me, I was stationed in Bloomington, Indiana. An adventurer would come out of Indiana. It's amazing what you've done with your life, uh, coming from. And I never even heard of Goshen, Indiana, but. What you've done is just absolutely amazing. Now, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? What, what did I want to be when I grew up? When you were a kid. What did you yeah. want to be when you grew up? Uh, yeah, um, probably a football star or a basketball star. I mean, like I said, I, just, I, I really love sports, mainly because much of anything else to do. Uh, in Goshen, um, yeah, so so probably that, but uh, it didn't take long uh, to realize that although I was good enough to play sports uh, at, on the high school teams, and then I even played Division three college uh, football, swimming, and rugby, I was nowhere near <laughs> good enough to actually play professional sports in any. Um, but I still, you know, still love playing sports. And as you mentioned, the title to my latest book, uh, A Pickleball Soap Opera, Love, Murder, and Pickleball, that's the the sport I've really gotten into uh, lately. And so, you know, as they say, write about what you know. So I decided to write a, uh, a, a romance thriller novel, but uh, revolving around a pickleball group, so I got to describe how to play pickleball in the novel. Okay, now who or what inspired you to pursue writing? What birthed your love for books, Jeff? Well, um, I've, I've spent most of my life around writers. My mom was a journalist. Um, my step-grandfather uh, was the editor of our local paper. Uh, my mom uh, worked at the paper. Eventually, she became city editor. Uh, I married an English professor, my wife, Alicia, and she, her first um, novel was published when she was just 21 years old, and she's actually had more books published than me, although wow. I'm 13. Yeah, I've had 13 and working on number 14 now. But so my my brother uh, is the editor of a newsletter, a political newsletter. So 
you know, it's just, I guess it's in the blood or the genes. Interesting. I got to tell you, one of the few guests we've had on, we've had a few, but most, there's like, I'm the first writer. There's nobody else in the family who even went remotely down the, down this path. Very interesting. So you you had that background in you when you first, when, how old were you? And then I want to start talking about the pickleball soap opera. How old were you when you absolutely knew you wanted to be a writer going on your 14th book? And when, how old were you when you actually sat down and started penning that very first novel? Yeah. Um, well, I started trying to write poetry in high school, and uh, I think it was pretty bad. But by the time I was in college, it had improved enough that I had a few poems published um so but at that point i knew i I wanted to write but i i didn't think it would be a major occupation um and i think i was pretty realistic that uh even though when i was in college i I wanted to write seriously i knew i i wouldn't make a living off it it wouldn't be my major occupation so i went to law school and became a lawyer and uh, law was very good to me. Um, I eventually had was the senior partner in a small firm and could pretty much set my own hours. So it gave me time to write and travel. And for, uh, oh, probably 20 years, I wrote a, a, a bunch of articles about uh, travel, what, what I called adventure travel from a spiritual perspective and so I kind of proved to myself that beyond legal writing I could write um, at least articles that were publishable and that people liked and so it wasn't until um, my last year in practice as a lawyer that I started work on an actual first book which was a novel um, and uh, it turned into the book entitled False Prophet, but it didn't get published. Uh, It was really bizarre, and a lot of writers can relate to this, a bizarre experience. I had a a verbal contract with a publisher and was working with an editor, and then the the publishing company closed its entire department. Fired the editor, and so they said, "Well, if you want to start over and submit again, we can consider oh my it." God. But I would say it was so <laughs> aggravating. I, I I just didn't bother. Oh my and the man, the manuscript just sat on the shelf. But so then, the first in the first year after I retired from law, I wrote a memoir. And uh, it, and which is called "Bringing Progress to Paradise," and it was picked up and published. And so that was my first published novel, uh, or not novel, sorry, uh, nonfiction memoir. But I did the False Prophet book got published then when uh, my wife and I discovered the uh, Kindle, Amazon Kindle publishing. And so we created our own publishing company called Midsummer Books, um, largely out of frustration (laughs) and annoyance with publishing companies because she'd had some similar experiences and had some bad experiences. And so we just decided we'd try out this new uh, technology and start our own company and publish whatever and whenever we wanted to. So, and that's how False Prophet got published. Good for you. You know, I just heard about an author who, it's kind of interesting you said that she had a contract. She had a book that was really hot. There was so much interest in it. But a lot of other publishers were publishing a similar book at the time, so the market was starting to get saturated. Well, the editor mm-hmm. who really believed in her book, and pick, the editor left the company, and then she was left flat. <laughs> she, she, had to, yeah. she had to put the book yeah. elsewhere or wrote another book that got picked up and got her career going years later. She said it was just, you just don't even know. You you, 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 you throw your hands up to celebrate, and then you had to bring them back down. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, now 
back real fast. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's really crushing because every writer knows when you've completed a book and edited and, you know, you feel really good about it, and especially when it's your first one, and like, oh, this is so wonderful, and I've got a contract, and then, oh, uh, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah, oh, my it's, goodness. But good for you that you, you pulled it back together. You, and self-publishing, when I self-published Portia in 1998, it has really changed People didn't respect a self-published book like none. Nobody would carry them. You you had to get on your knees and beg. <laughs> People were like, no. Mm-hmm. Now it's it's really changed, and I think that's good to give creative artists and music and books and film more control of their careers. I think is is a good thing. Now you've written and published, going on your fourteen books or thirteen. Uh, can you introduce us? You mentioned it earlier in the show, but can you introduce off-the-shelf listeners to your latest book, A Pickleball, A Soap Opera? Uh, Can you give us just a quick overview of the story? Sure. So it starts out with uh, introducing a main character who is a lawyer who has just retired from um, his uh, very successful business, but his wife uh, died within the last year, kind of unexpectedly from ca- aggressive cancer. And now he's sort of at lost ends. Uh, he had this uh, vision of what retirement would be like with his wife. They were going to travel and, <clears throat> excuse me, do all these wonderful things. And now it's just, you know, shot to hell. Uh And he's kind of lost. So the opening scene is he's in a YMCA locker room after having done a workout with his former law partner who realizes that Jack is lost and the the, uh, other partner, Kim, invites Jack to play pickleball, which Kim has been playing now for a, a number of months and is really loves the game. And Jack reluctantly agrees. And Jack had been a tennis star in college. And so he's, you know, he's a good athlete and he's a big guy. Um, and so he, but he reluctantly agrees and, and, you know, thinks, well, maybe this will help sort of lift me out of this depression. And he, goes and he turns out he really enjoys the game and similarly meets a woman there a romance uh begins and then the narrative turns dark <laughs> mm. uh because because there was a a murder case that Jack had handled years ago and uh, had gotten the defendant off, and then that defendant just disappeared. And it turns out that he's become a CIA agent, and he's infiltrated Al-Qaeda, and I won't say a lot more, but things develop that uh, the, the CIA agent's brother decides that he needs to take revenge on Jack and anybody close to Jack. Uh, and wow. he happens to be a, a psychotic personality. So this pickleball has become this, you know, really fun, warm collegial group is now in danger. And so. It sounds, it sounds interesting. And you know what? I like those kind of stories that they start off, Almost innocent enough, and but they they have this they they build the story. It sounds like it's a story that builds as the reader uh, continues to turn the pages. And I love those stories. <laughs> they just keep building, building, building. Now, so what, what pulls him? Can you before we talk more about his depression? And you you saying he's depressed. His wife passed away. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Jack? Did he and his wife have kids? What's his personality like? And why is he so lonely? Was his wife like his whole world? He didn't have friends? Yeah, so they were childless. They had tried to have kids, and it just didn't work, and they eventually um, stopped trying and decided not to adopt 
because the life they had was really great. <laughs> and, you know, having uh, a very successful career and they had a, you know, a big fancy house in an expensive neighborhood and they got to travel a lot and eventually it sort of dawned on them that, oh, gee, if we actually, if we would adopt, this is really going to change and we really enjoy the life we have together. So, um, so yeah, so childless and his wife is his best friend as well as his lover and wife. And, uh, they, they had a circle of friends that were very close and did lots of things together, but the, and so she dies and now he's just kind of left out there without a real social life and without his companion and no kids. Um, and his brother, he had one brother, but, uh, who died in Iraq. Uh, he was a military pilot and crash. So, and both his parents are dead. <laughs> oh, wow. So he, really he is. Is a, a he lover. is. He is. He is. So is it this pickleball game, this woman he meets and how long is he, is his wife passed when he meets this woman? Is it this new woman who helps to pull him out of his this depression? Yeah, in a way. His wife has been dead almost a year um, when he starts playing pickleball. And he meets this woman, he plays, and they are immediately uh, attracted to each other. There's just, a, you know, that kind of spark that happens um, when they first meet and then they play together and of course he's at this point he's just learning the game but because he's just he's a natural athlete and was a really great tennis player he's very rapidly and they decide uh that they will play as partners uh in this club tournament and uh so the their romance is kind of developing on the pickleball court but he's, you know, he hasn't asked a woman out for a date for 30 years. And he's sort of bumblingly <laughs> working his way, working, trying to work up the courage to actually go out on a date. Uh, and so there's sort of a comedic scene of him trying to do that and her realizing what he's doing and making it not easy for him. Uh, even though she really wants to go out with him. And, but so then they have a date and it goes really well and seems to be taking off. Um, <laughs> but then there's this secondary ca character, his, uh, his best friend and former law partner who has introduced him to pickleball and is the president of this club where they're playing. And it's kind of a, fancy pants country club uh, place. Um, and it turns out that Kim, the the friend who is supposed to be the perfect family man and the, sort of the model of all these people at the club, they all look up to him, is actually having an affair <laughs> another woman who's in the pickleball group. Wow. And so... So this Just has, you know, <laughs> yeah, ri rippling consequences, <laughs> which makes wow. the social life a little more in um, before yeah. the, the murder mystery even uh, Oh, picks my up. goodness. It, okay, I'm picturing him now. When you say law, and I don't know why I'm doing this, I see a stiff guy, a very stiff, um, uh, like really stiff. It has to be this way. It, this is the way it should be, kind of guy. Uh, polos. I'm seeing this khaki preppy guy. Is that him? Yes, you're 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 right on. He's, you know, as so many lawyers are, they're you know always trying to phrase everything correctly and use uh, you know proper language. And he's you know he's for, and this is said in 2019. So just a few years ago. And so he's, you know, much more of sort of a formal, traditional guy than most people are these days. But he's a very good athlete. And so in, when he's playing pickleball, he's not at all stiff. He's really, you know, lets himself go. 
and is this uh you know this sort of physical animalistic side of him comes out uh and he's a very aggressive <laughs> player on the pickleball smashes the ball into other people and things like that. So there's this, you know, really kind of a dualistic aspect to his personality. Ah, now tell us about his new, he sounds interesting himself. He is, a, a, sound like a very well-developed character. But can you tell us about Jack's new love interest, and particularly her background, but I really wanted to ask you, well, don't give the story away, but can she really be trusted? Um, yeah, Nellie is a very recently retired social worker um, whose wow. husband was also, like Jack's brother, a military pilot, and he is MIA and presumed dead. And that happened uh, almost two years ago. Uh, so she thinks she's a widow and it turns out he's actually alive which adds a whole nother wow. uh, complicated wrinkle to the story but uh and that's sort of a, a subplot mystery but uh she's a very kind um compassionate person you know having been a social worker um and her best friend, <laughs> is, his name is Cat, is the sort of the, the club floozy who is having the affair with um, with Kim, Jack's best friend, which Jack and Nellie don't know that this affair is going on uh, until later, much later in the book. This story sounds more interesting. Oh my goodness! This is one of the things. Even even I remember your first interview. It feels like more of pulling out in this. When I hear authors talk about their stories, and this is one of the good things. Like, as an author, the final way to use this as a marketing. When you talk more about your story, it makes people want to buy it. That's when I get more and more interested. Not just in the description of the synopsis on the book and you know, using your keywords in your book cover, but you hear the author actually talk about the different characters. That's what pulls out my interest. Now, I have to ask you, just reading in the research for the, this interview, does Jack have PTSD? And if so, how does that hamper this mystery? Yeah, he does not. The character who is the lurking mer um the dangerous character, he has PTSD. He he was a, a Marine in Afghanistan, and he was uh, in a convoy that got blown up, and he suffered uh, some injuries, but a very um, severe uh, brain trauma. And he he's the brother of a CIA agent who... Actually, well, I, I, it's, it'd be too much of a spoiler to say yeah, much yeah, more don't, than don't, that. But, don't, but, don't, but, yeah, yeah, so, want, so, want so no, Jack, like, Jack oh, I gotta not. get that book. I gotta get that book. Pickleball, <laughs> pickleball, and then the story, the title. I want to let our listeners know again is pick, the a pickleball soap opera by Jeff Rosby. That's the that's the book that we are talking about now. Uh, again, a pickleball soap opera, and it was such a cool title. I have to ask you this before we move on to another one of your books. Is the story based on real-life events? You practice law. You were into sports. You like pickleball. Is this story based on real-life events? And if not, where did you get the idea for a pickleball soap opera? Yeah, it's the, the character Jack, um, I will have to admit, has... Uh, some uh, similarities to me in my life, but it's not real close. Uh, but yeah, and again, you know, trying to write about what you know, I know pretty well uh, what a retired <laughs> lawyer uh, who had a successful practice is like. So writing his character came pretty easily. Um, 
but uh, in terms of like the, the murder mystery, the CIA, the uh, war in Afghanistan, and uh, counterterrorism, all of which gets worked into the book. No, I, I had to I had to do a lot of research to be able to try to make that realistic. Okay, now let's talk. That this is a pickleball soap opera off the shelf, listeners. Jeff Rosley, a pickleball soap opera. I encourage you to get a copy. You, if, if you came in midstream, I, I was I always say when it's, the show finishes streaming, you can go back and listen to it in the archives as many times as you like and share it with people people who love a good story. And this is a mystery, and the characters sound complex. And I love a story with complex characters that have been very well developed. So it's a pickleball Soap opera by Jeff Rossi. So now we want to talk about another one of your books, America's Existential Crisis: Our Inherited Obligation to Native Nations. What is what is this book about? And is it fiction or nonfiction? It's nonfiction, and it's really it's a weaving together a, a story and history. So the the history is about uh, how. <laughs> Native American uh, tribes, Native American nations were really um, lied to uh, and cheated uh, into what turned into the reservation system. So it's a, it's a history of how the reservation system was developed and what a, a cruel and terrible way to treat the indigenous people of America out to be. And then the personal uh, memoir part of it is that I had one ancestor who was uh, in the 7th U.S. Cavalry and he was in, spent his military career as an Indian fighter. He was in the Indian Wars and he was actually at the very last battle or massacre uh, that ended the Indian Wars and really ended the Indian resistance um, to the reservation system, which was Wounded Knee. And you know, most everybody's heard of the massacre of Wounded Knee or the Battle of Wounded Knee. So he was a lieutenant leading a troop there, and he left a long letter describing the event from his perspective. And he was also interviewed by Harper's Magazine. And so there's his letter and the interview that was preserved. And then uh, sort of t terribly, but uh, in a way maybe justly, the day after the massacre, while his troop was doing what would you call a mopping up action, trying to run down the Indians, the, he was shot, wounded, and died uh, 17 days later from sepsis, from the wound. But in that, that period of time, he was able to write that letter and be interviewed. So I have another ancestor who um, was a great friend of the Potawatomi in northern Indiana, and he was... He was given a beautiful deerskin beaded vest because he helped the, uh, the, what was left of the local Potawatomi tribe survive a very hard winter because he was a merchant uh, with a store and a sawmill, and he was very generous with them. And so they uh, gave him this vest as a token of appreciation, which was handed down through five generations and to me. Uh, so I wow. learned the hist learned the history of both of these ancestors as you know these very different uh, ways that white people had relationships with Native Americans, and so I weave their stories and my discovery of their stories into that um, general history. Went out to Wounded Knee and talk to the local Native Americans out there. And, uh, you know, so that sort of pilgrimage to Wounded Knee is also told as a road trip story, um, which sort of carries the narrative through as I'm describing 
the history of the ancestors and the general history while I'm on this road trip driving through um, the Indian country, the reservations. Oh, my gosh. It's just, it's just so sad. I mean, down here where I'm at in Chattanooga, you can, they have the markers of the trail, and it, I just, it's just horrific. I, I, to me, it's just... I, uh, it isn't even words. And I grew up as a kid seeing cowboy and Indian movies. They always made the Indians look just like vicious, awful, horrible, savagery people. And the cowboys were just yeah. these angelic people. And even as a kid, I knew something's wrong with this story. That just there's no way that these one type of people could all be one-dimensional angelic good, all of them, and all these other people <laughs> are just all bad. I just as a kid, I knew something's wrong with this story. <laughs> I knew as a kid that's just not humanly possible. There's no group of people who everybody in it is good, and there's no who who, who are these people, and no people where everybody in it is just doing bad. Who where are these people at? So when you hear this, I'm like, nah, that just doesn't even make sense. But it's just it's just. Well, so yeah, like you, Denise. Yeah, I played cowboys and Indians as a kid, and that I, the Indians were the bad guys, the cowboys were the good guys. And so I have a chapter <laughs> in the book about um, the, the the way Native Americans are have been portrayed in pop culture, going back to those movies and TV shows we saw as kids and how kids played cowboys and Indians, and then how that began to change and how eventually Native, Native Americans became cool and, you know, their 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 style uh, became cool. And, uh, but that it's still, you know, not really as fully human beings. Uh, but, yeah, so there's a, a whole chapter talking about that and giving examples of it. Yeah, it's almost like... We, I, it's as if we, the, the, what the world has one culture, and anything other than that is wrong. And I don't. It's, it's, it's where, where does this even come from? It's just, it's, it's very, very confusing. Now, what can the nation do to right wrongs that have been inflicted on Native Americans? It's almost. I feel like Native Americans that used to be so populous in North America are like out of sight, out of mind. Like just, just put them on yeah, well, right. Well, before Columbus came, there were it's estimated that there were 50 million Native Americans in North America, and now and now there's five million. So their population was absolutely decimated by the European conquest of North America. And so, yeah, so we put them on reservations, and like you say, out of sight, out of mind. We, we you know, we don't want to deal with the fact that our ancestors uh, slaughtered, <laughs> slaughtered them, and then the ones that survived, we stuck on these reservations. And you know, there's the the Trail of Tears and the and uh, Potawatomi, where I'm, Indiana, the ones that my uh, ancestor who has the delightful name of Valentine Berkey uh, that he was friends with, they had the Trail of Death where they were forced marched at gunpoint from northern Indiana out to Oklahoma and many of them died along the way. And that, that's not known as well as the Trail of Tears uh, from Tennessee uh, to Oklahoma, but uh, yeah, same thing on a smaller scale. So what can we do to to right some of the wrongs other than learn the – there's more than one culture in the world, and it's – we it would do us all good to accept each other more. What, what, what more can be done to help right some of these wrongs? Yeah, well, and that's how the the last uh, couple chapters in the book address that very specific question. And my answer is that we need to invest a significant amount of capital uh, into the community development of uh, Native American communities. Um, I don't think the idea of reparations 
politically has a chance. Um, and I don't think just coming up with some dollar amount and handing a check over to in is 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 really going to work to do to accomplish what I think needs to be accomplished. But I think what needs to be accomplished is their schools are terrible. So they need to, in their communities, we need to invest to develop good schools, have their schools at least as good as uh, the average schools around the country. Uh, they don't have infrastructure. There's a lot of reservations, don't have Internet at all, don't even have telephone. Radio doesn't reach them. So invest in developing that kind of infrastructure. And then uh, same with health care. On every single measurable uh, from alcohol addiction, unemployment, uh, nourishment, uh, life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, Native Americans are the worst, um, absolutely at the bottom on all of those metrics. So in, invest in improving their health care system, um, mental health uh, clinics, um, and then lastly, invest in helping them start their own businesses. Uh, you know, a lot of people know about the casinos and certain tribes who have popular casinos as a source of really good revenue, and that's benefited uh, certain tribes, but there's all these others that don't have that, and they don't have any business, any significant business, and so um, they need economic development to get it started. So that's, you know, what my uh, my solution is. The country has to uh, make an investment because we owe it. It's a it's a moral obligation because of what we've done to the Native American population to basically bring them up to the average standard on all these different metrics, and then it's up to them. Um, you know, I I don't I don't think a an eternal welfare system good for anybody because it just creates this culture of dependency. But you have to get get it started. You know, if you don't have anything, you got to have capital to get things started. So, and what's really interesting, <laughs> while I was writing this book, doing the research. The Biden administration made the biggest investment exactly what I was describing in the history of our country. Uh, in, in the big um, trillion dollar um, Save America fund, the, the huge bill that was passed right at the beginning of the Biden administration because of COVID and the recession, well, $32 billion was allocated to Native tribes. Mm. And that's all. And it's been allocated in a very intelligent way because it's it has all these different um, funds that are going to go to all the different things that I mentioned. And the other really good thing that uh, Biden did is he appointed Deb Holland, who is a Native American, to be head of the Department of Interior, which the department in which the Bureau of Indian Affairs is. So she is the first Native American who's the Secretary of the Interior and the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So you've got somebody who can walk the walk and talk the talk and make sure that those funds are used the way they should be. Awesome. Got to take that first step sometime. That is great, 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 great news. Now, I definitely, as we come down about 15 minutes left in the show, I definitely want to talk about this next book because if all of your books, I think, well, uh, 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 this, uh, the, the Picketball Soap Opera, that's like a mystery, great characters. Uh, America's existential crisis, our inherited obligation to Native na nations. That's something that's really central to, we could say, North America or the United States in that in that regard. But this book 
has, to me, a, like universal impact. So tell us about your book, You Have to Get Lost Before You Get Found. Is this a book about travel? When you're, you're traveling, you have to take risk, or what is what is you have to get lost before you can be found about? <laughs> well, it's... Um... It's a it's a memoir uh, and a history. Um, so it describes my own, uh, I guess, transition from being just an adventure traveler who went to the Nepal Himalayas to see the mountains and then climb mountains to starting a foundation over there and working in a remote area of Nepal to do with a uh, indigenous tribe exactly what I was just describing for uh, Native American communities. And we've uh, created a a school, um, a hydroelectric system, um, a water system, a medical clinic, and a number of other smaller projects in this remote area. Um, And the reason that the first time I went to Nepal, uh, I had just turned 40, was having a uh, midlife crisis, and I came home from work one day, and my wife slapped a brochure on the table down in front of me and said, why don't you go do this? And it was a brochure in the Mount Everest base camp trail, and so she was basically saying, hey, buddy, go take a hike and do it on the other side of the world. <laughs> there you go. Uh, she, but she, maybe she knew what you needed. She was motivating you, inspiring you. <laughs> yeah, so I did, and I just I fell in love with uh, the culture and the people mountains over there and kept going back and developed this foundation. And... Um, so the, the metaphorically the you have to get lost before you can be found was that I was feeling kind of lost and I found myself in a new way by becoming a mountain climber and a trekking leader uh, and, and uh, a philanthropist in terms of running this foundation. And then there's also a very uh, specific story uh, in the book um, in where I got lost by myself up on a a Himalayan peak and spent um, all day trying to find my to uh, the rest of my team in in our base camp. Oh, my gosh. So there's that adventure. Oh my God! Were you afraid? The, I was definitely beginning to get panicky because at first I thought, oh, oh you know, that's no big deal. And then when I couldn't find the trail uh, back oh. to our base camp, it <laughs> yeah, it it started to get scary. Oh, I would have been petrified. How long were you gone away from, how did you get separated from your group, and how long were you separated before you realized, I am lost? Well, um, there are guy there, so our, our group, we were trekking Asa Village, which is the center of where the foundation uh, does its work, and we, we were trekking with the guys that were carrying all the parts to build a hydroelectric system. But we we stopped on the way. Um, we're going to climb this mountain. Um, well, there were only two of us uh, Americans that felt fit enough uh, to try the climb. And so our guide, our chief guide, the three of us start up the mountain and Mike, the other American, uh, started feeling sick, and he was going very slow, and I was feeling very fit, and so I went on ahead, and I was getting further and further ahead of those two. The, um, they stopped, and I'm looking down the mountainside at them, and I wave at them and signal I'm just going to go on up, assuming that they would come up slowly. 
So I got up to the summit and had these fantastic views of all these, you know, majestic. And then it's time to go down because a storm is rolling in. The clouds are really building up and looking threatening. And when I realize I better get going, I'm enveloped in a cloud. And there's only about feet visibility. And it just seemed like the route down, um, which I thought I knew where it was, had disappeared. And I did. And um, so I just decided, well, that's, you know, and the other guys haven't come up and it's been long enough. I think, well, they must have just turned back. But, you know, no problem. I found my way up here. I'll find my way down. But I can't find (laughs) where the route down starts. So I thought, well, I'll just start, you know, bushwhacking my way down route. Um, But I couldn't see very well. And oh, so I, you know, had to slide down an ice over waterfall and jump and climb down some rock faces and and uh you know this whole time the visibility is really low and eventually i realize i can't find the trail at the base of the mountain take me back to base camp so then i'm scrambling all around on this mountain you know going this way and that and back up and back down <laughs> trying to find this trail which eventually i did um but it was nightfall oh, by my the time I, I, I found you, it. So, you, life, life seems like that. Just life itself. If, if you don't get out, if you get out of a routine, some of our lives are. I think the way we stay safe, we just live the same day over and over and over. And by the time your life's over, you live maybe a hundred days, and the, and you just repeated <laughs> them over and over and over and over. So you safe, like you said, you didn't know. You didn't know the trail to get down. Well, if you live your life over and over and over, you pretty much can predict what's going to happen the next day because you're not going to change anything. Is it true you seem like an adventurous person? For risk takers, people who I think about my heroes and heroes, uh, they're not people who try to live the same day over and over. Definitely not. Is it is it true that we have to get lost before we can be found when you look back over your life path so far, would you say from people you've read or read about or met, those who go on to do greater things, things that their heart's really calling them to do, that that's been the case? Yeah, I mean, I I can't say that I've, you know, really researched that to speak to a lot of other people, but I I've known people that have done what and including myself what I would call failing up where it seems like something has gone wrong in life but instead of just giving up uh accepting defeat uh if we just find another path or make our own path uh a different path um you find a new a new self um and that's so that's sort of the psychological point of that book is to say that for anybody who's feeling lost, instead of just giving up, find something completely different to do. I mean, whether it's a hobby or a new job, uh, new friends, whatever, uh, just find something completely different and see if that leads you down a a new path that you discover a, a new you 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 have enough courage to do that. My father was like that, and I and I and I definitely wanted to ask you this. So when you got lost and you said you started to get afraid, you don't know how long you're gonna be lost. Am I gonna meet up with the group again, et cetera, et cetera? When you were found, did you, did something in you say? And it doesn't sound like you heeded to it. If it did, don't ever do that again. Don't ever take another risk. Some people, something happens, they're like, I'll never do that again. I'll never take another risk. Some people are like, no, I'm going back out, take another risk. I'm not giving in to fear. What approach did you take once you got back to the group? Well, the the overwhelming feeling I had when I got back was, thank God I am back with the group. And something 
an effect it had on me was to make me realize what social animals we are, how we need other people. Because when I, when I was out there by myself, at first, it was pretty cool. I mean, I was enjoying myself. And even when at first I, I realized, darn, I can't find that uh, trail, um, I, I still, it was, oh, this is a cool adventure. You know, I'm experiencing something I really haven't experienced before, which is being lost and alone on a Himalayan mountain. Um, but then after a while, it's like, well, I don't want to be alone anymore. <laughs> this is this is scary, and uh, I, I want to be with my group. And so when I, I found them, it just, I so much appreciated how being with friends, being with family, being with people who care about you care about how how that really completes a person and without that you're not really a full person wow i agree i agree i thank you for for sharing that and then still being adventurous can you we have less than like about three minutes left can you give us real real quick snippet of the your 14th book what you're working on and when we can expect to, to see it on the market yeah, um, the working title is uh, Book of Wisdoms, and what I'm doing is I'm taking 72 quotes, uh, some of them very famous, others not very famous, and um, describing the person who said that or wrote that and what the context was, and then trying to really dig down deeply into uh, the really the deep meaning of what that wisdom is, and so it's um, it's intended to take on 72 different issues about important issues in life that we all have concerns about, you know, from very sort of mundane thing. Uh, uh, you have an annoying friend and how do you deal with somebody who you truly care about but is really annoying you to how did this all start? How did the universe start? And how do I find a good, successful life? And so, mm, it's, you know, kind of all what's this, the, this huge what's the title again? Uh, well, the working title is... <laughs> Book of Wisdoms, Book of or Book of Seventy Two Wisdoms. I, I haven't I love settled that. on Book it absolutely. Book of Seventy Two Wisdoms. Book of Seventy Two yeah. Wisdoms. Yes. Oh my God! I hope it takes off. Book and with your travels and what you've learned. Book of Seventy Two Wisdoms. Now, where can off the shelf listeners get a copy of your books, Jeff? Um, they're all on Amazon, uh, and they're also on my website. So the website you mentioned uh, early on, uh, the J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-R-E-S-L-E-Y.com, that website, or just Google my name or uh, go to Amazon and input my name and you'll find all the books. And where can people find you? Are you on social media networks, anywhere people can find you if they want to keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, uh, thanks, Denise. I'm I'm on Twitter, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our Midsummer Books uh, Publishing House has a Facebook page also. Midsummer Books. So we have been just what a treat. Oh my goodness, I, I've enjoyed connecting with you on the, on the first interview and and on this one as well. I encourage you to visit Jeff Rosley online. J E F F R E Y R A S L E Y dot com. Again, J E F F R E Y R A S L E Y dot com. And I'll start promoting the show as soon as it finishes streaming before the show started promoting it. And I will uh, be promoting it again after it finishes streaming. Uh, and I'll send you a link to the show, Jeff, after it finishes streaming. Thank you so much for being here again with us. I just so enjoy you. Just a great, great guest. And to all of our off-the-shelf listeners, 
Thank you for tuning in. Again, if you came in middle of the interview, no worries when it finishes streaming. You can listen to it in its entirety, and I encourage you to share it. With book lovers, travelers, adventurers, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And I'll see you back here next Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or New York City time. And remember, just mark it on your calendars. Off the shelf, Saturday mornings, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is also New York New York City time. Thank you so much, Jeff, and to our listeners again. Remember, you're incredible. You are awesome. You are phenomenal. Go out and create a wonderful day for yourself. See you back here next Saturday. Bye for now.